So grateful for your worship, church, and thank you for your worship in the courts as well. I had a chance to poke my head in earlier and just uh, see how God was working. Uh, it, it's so important during uh, times, sometimes we're hurting, we're dealing with challenges to be able to, to come before the Lord and recognize that he receives us there. And so we're going we're gonna to adjust here back to the beginning of a series. It's a little bit different, but can also be the source of a lot of heartache. We're going to talk today about conflict today. Now, I know there's probably nobody here who's had any conflict in your life in the last year. Uh, just, in fact, just out of, out of curiosity, by a show of hands, uh, both in the courts and here in the room, in fact, if you're watching uh, from home, you can raise your hands as well, I suppose. Um, how many of you have seen major conflict uh, in a church, a school, a business, or family in the last year? Raise your hand. All right. Some of you put two hands up. All right. <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been a tough year in this regard. So I want us to look at a passage of scripture that talks about conflict because it's impossible to escape conflict in our lives. In fact, somebody said, if you don't want to have conflict, don't say nothing, don't have nothing, don't do nothing. It's bad grammar, but it's true. And so would you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 6? Acts chapter 6, we're going to look at an example of something inevitable in any growing church. Let me say a couple of things before that. First of all, I know of no specific conflict. I, I mentioned we, we preached on uh, stewardship and giving a few weeks ago, and we weren't doing so because people weren't giving and the budget was crashing. Quite the opposite, and the same thing is the case here. I've, I've been so blessed to watch the hearts of God's people unite over the last 18 months with everything that's gone on and, and seeing God's people move forward around Kingsland. But nevertheless, it doesn't mean there's not strife that we deal with all the time. We've got to be ready. Um, as you're turning there, um, this Thursday, the 20th, May the 20th, and from 6 to 7.30 p.m., we have a very special um, uh, event taking place here at Kingsland called Next Generation Leadership. It's a wonderful panel of people who walk through business and, and, uh, and industry and walk through those challenges. This is not just for those searching for a job, but anyone who's in industry and wants to know how they best can carry out their faith in the marketplace. Uh, it'll be a great time of networking, however, as well. And so you can register online. It's a free event, but we need you to register. It's going to be unforgettable this Thursday, the 20th, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And then if you haven't already signed up, acts2houston.org is how you register for the service event, the citywide service event this uh, Saturday morning, the 22nd. And then Pentecost Sunday, there's a worship service uh, all around the city. We'll gather in Northwest Houston to hear Dr. Tony Evans preach, but you have to register because uh, seating is limited. You can do that at acts2houston.org. All right? So this church is, is growing in the book of Acts. God's doing amazing things. But you know what we find in the Bible? Where there's life, there's growth. Where there's growth, there are problems. And where there are problems, there are solutions. Where there are solutions, there's even more growth. And that's what I love about this text. I think it's a great one to go to when we're trying to decide how are we supposed to deal with the conflicts that we face. Acts chapter 6. Let me turn there in my Bible, and you look on as I read. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, It would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole company, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. I love how that ends. If you want to know evidence of revival, even the priests got saved. I mean, there's a lot going on here. But do you see what took place at the beginning? Let me give you some context. First of all, uh, most scholars believe this took place in the early mid-30s of the first century, perhaps five years or so after Pentecost. The church is doing great things. God is moving 
And what happens is there's a, there's a group of widows who need to be cared for in any church. And in this case, there are some from a uh, Hebraic background. In other words, they're, they're Israeli. They probably speak Aramaic. They, they, they practice the, the normal traditional Hebrew traditions. There are other Jews who have come to faith, but they are Hellenistic or they're from Greek backgrounds. They speak Greek. They, they have Greek traditions. So there's a, there's a culture difference going on here. And there's apparently a misunderstanding of who's receiving the greater portion. So they're saying, wait, the, the, uh, the Judaic Jews, the, the Hebraic Jews are receiving a greater portion. They're, they're doing this. And, and the, by the way, the Hellenistic Jewish widows are being discriminated against. So you can see, this, this can create a tremendous rift in this church at this time. They're in the midst of conflict that can be super dangerous to the church at, at this moment if they don't deal with it. This could go either way. We know how it turns out. Some really good things happen. But we don't know it at the time. If you could zoom in and be in the church in that moment, and this is the case with every relationship, with every church, every group, every family, Every business, every classroom can deal, can, can face conflict, can't they? And I believe we can overcome that conflict when we recognize some temptations that befall all of us in the midst of conflict that the apostles overcame here. I want to talk to you this morning about three temptations that you have to overcome in the midst of conflict. And when you overcome them, you can find healing. Can I show those to you? First of all, I want you to see the temptation that we all face in the midst of conflict to assume the worst. The temptation to assume the worst. You'll notice the account begins with a major assumption. It says there arose a complaint. Now, I want you to notice this was not a concern that arose. It was a complaint that arose. There is a difference. The Greek word used here means grumbling or murmuring. It's the same word used in Philippians 2.14 when Paul says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. The difference is with a concern, I might observe a problem that needs a solution, but it might be accidental. It just needs to be solved. With a complaint, I am assuming injustice, and I think that they're intentionally targeting a group of people. So they've connected all these dots, do you see, that aren't there? They said, oh, no, this isn't just a concern. Wow, we, we see that there's something taking place here. Can we get to the bottom of it? Can, we, can you help me understand? No, no, there arose a complaint because they said, no, these people don't like these other people. Do you see what's happening? In essence, the people in the church were spreading conspiracy theories, A conspiracy theory, that might sound like kind of a a grandiose term, but it's exactly what we see here. A conspiracy theory, by definition, is the belief that covert, influential movers are responsible for something taking place. And it happens all the time. On the personal level, you assume you know everything somebody's thinking and all their motives. On a national level, international level, these things happen. Conspiracy theories are often introduced when there are elements of a situation that feel out of control. And so in order to fill in the gaps, we embrace theories. It's important to note, by the way, that conspiracy theories could be true, couldn't they? Uh, You remember Watergate? (laughs) There have been times in history where people said, I think this is what's going on. And everybody said, no, no, no. And then you found out, wow, lo and behold, that was the case. But the problem with basing our decisions on conspiracy theories is at that time they have no basis in fact. Do you see? Conspiracy theories help people meet two basic needs. It allows me to feel like I have some special inside knowledge and also provides me a feeling of control when I desperately need it. And so before making assumptions about the hearts of people with whom I disagree, I need to do everything I can to diagnose the real problem and to avoid misdiagnosis of surface problems by assuming the worst. Michael Shermer wrote an article called The Conspiracy Theory Detector in the Scientific American. And while he's talking more on the national scale, this applies so well to every conflict you can name. 
he argues uh, we can't dismiss all theories because conspiracies uh, do exist, but there's a paradigm we can use to evaluate the probability that something is true. And, and let me just give you four of those items. He says, when there's no real evidence to support the supposed pattern of connecting the dots, it's likely to be false. He says, if it takes superhuman feats of intellect or power, it's likely false because people are not as powerful as they believe they are. Third, if a conspiracy involved a large number of elements to complete it successfully, it's likely false. And fourth, if a large number of people would all need to maintain silence, the more people involved with any conspiracy, the less likely silence can be maintained. I could go on and on, but you can see how this can happen. Hey, do bad people have agendas always? Do politicians lie? <laughs> Some do. <laughs> Can corporations be greedy? Of course. But that doesn't mean every event is due to a conspiracy. So make sure you do your homework. And this is very important for the believers I'm talking to because you need to take great care before you pass along information. A, a viral tweet can reach tens of millions of people in a day. Uh, a few months ago, there was one account on Twitter called 10GOP, which alleged to be the Tennessee Republican Party. It gained over 136 followers before anybody realized it was a total fake. And, and the messages were often retweeted thousands of times, often untrue or misleading, and sometimes they were retweeted by national leaders or news organizations. In fact, you know what was found out? That Twitter account was operated by Russians. It was a troll farm meant to spread disinformation to disrupt our way of life. So that's a really strange example because it's a real conspiracy propagating conspiracy theories. Isn't that crazy? So here's the bottom line. If you don't know for sure that something's true, you have no right to pass it along. Proverbs chapter 14, 24 says this. Don't let your mouth speak dishonestly and don't let your lips talk deviously. It can be so disabling to an organization or a community or a family or a church or a nation when people don't, don't look for the facts. Do you see? We see this all the time. The newspaper prints a lie. Where does that go? On the front page. When they correct the lie, where does it go? Small print on the back page. That's how it works. It doesn't matter if you say, it looks interesting. What do you think? It may not be your lie, but if you propagate it, that's gossip. And the scripture calls that sin. Now, most, most of us, when we think about conspiracy, we think about national issues. But can you see how this works the same way in personal situations where, where you see something happen and all of a sudden you make these assumptions and, and before people can put it back away, it, you've propagated it. I remember a few years ago, I was in the Holy Land with some of you, and I had the privilege of preaching a message, which I love to do there, that was uh, on video, and then it was sent back here and shown in the service. I get to preach on site the Word of God. It's, it's a really great blessing. And that morning, Sunday morning, I preached from the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem. What a thrill. And, you know, we're eight hours ahead of, um, uh, rather, we're eight hours behind Israel here. And so it wasn't shown for a few hours from when I shared the message. And so uh, I turned it on and was watching. It wasn't live, but it was as close as you could possibly get without y'all getting up at 3 a.m. to watch, okay? And I was watching this broadcast of the message, and below it, there was a dude in the comment section that was not going to let go. He said, I know what you're doing. I can tell that's a green screen, and you're just filming that from the back room of the church. And he just kept on, doubled down. And so I switched over. I was trying to get him on Messenger to say, hey, bro, can I send you a picture, like, from Jerusalem right now? Because you don't know what you're talking about. But he had so convinced that he, himself that he connected the dots, he wanted everybody to know. Do you see? What's the alternative to assuming the worst? It's not merely assuming the best about a situation because that might not be true either. The alternative is to get to the heart of the problem. Find out the truth. Find out the intentions as best you can. So you go back to the passage and the example we have here. What was the real problem? There was an accusation. What was the problem related to this inequity in the distribution? Was it discrimination? Well, I, I know one guess that scholars have made that I agree with is that there was no 
intentional discrimination taking place, you know what the problem probably was? A language barrier. That's it. If you look back at the text, look at the names of those who I believe to be the first deacons, those seven men who were chosen. They are all Greek names as opposed to Hebrew names. They brought in people for whom Greek was their primary language. And that implies that the problem was they didn't quite understand the culture. They weren't hearing the depth of the problems. And so they just weren't addressing things because they didn't know And so some saw that and said, well, they just hate these other people and they have an agenda against. No, there was a language barrier, do you see? And so they addressed the heart of the problem rather than assuming the worst about those who were serving. How many times in the past year have there been major fallouts over language? Somebody's using this word this way. Somebody says, oh, that's not true. And they use the word another way. They're using the same word, but they're using a different dictionary. And there's fallouts in families and on social media and in community groups and in churches and everywhere else you can name because of these things. When There really just needs to be understanding rather than assuming the worst. Kaiser, Kaiser South Hospital in San Francisco had a, a little bit of a crisis a few years ago in which um, there were... Uh, a lot of challenges taking place with the nurses who worked there. Uh, An an inordinate number of mistakes. And so it was assumed that they just had nurses who had gotten lax and were lazy, weren't paying attention, having a good time. And and so they just kind of put the hammer down and said, well, I'll tell you what, and we're going to tighten up the guidelines and we're going to increase the the reviews and we're going to let you have it and we're going to put people on probation and we're going to have you toe the line. And there was one particular nurse in charge uh, named Becky Richards who saw the problem, but she saw it differently. She started to look around and recognize that these nurses for whom life was in their hands were asked to do everything under the sun on that floor. Some of you have been in the hospital and seen that. They, they're highly trained to keep people alive, and people are saying, hey, can you get me a pillow? Can you get me a blanket? I need another chair over here. And, and they were just the ones that became gophers, and they're trying to be nice and do all these other things. Well, they're also trying to help keep people alive. And so this nurse uh, put in one particular strategy. Becky Richards mandated across the hospital that any time a nurse was going to uh, disseminate medicine, that nurse, he or she had to put on an orange vest, like parking vest like you see, or somebody working on the roadside that's really just, you, you can't miss it. And uh, that seemed a little strange, but the point was, when somebody's wearing an orange vest on this floor, they cannot be spoken to. Don't ask them about dinner last night. Don't, don't talk to them about getting help with anything because they are doing a life and death task and they're bringing medication. And guess what happened? The errors dropped by 47% that next year. Well, it's because somebody stopped assuming the worst and and started addressing the problem. When you're in conflict, you got to overcome the temptation to assume the worst about a friend, a family member, a brother, a sister in Christ, whoever it is, a coworker, and find out the truth. Understanding leads to improvement. Here's the second temptation I want you to see. The temptation to abandon the best You're in the heat of the moment, you're hurting, you're angry, something's happened, and you make some rash decision that impacts your life in a negative way, sometimes out of spite, sometimes out of hurt, but you have now abandoned something that's critical because you're pursuing this other thing. So this can happen in a couple of ways. I've seen it happen uh, where I talk to people and say, hey, through the years, um, are you, are you in a community group or, or a Sunday school class or whatever you, you call it? And they say, well, no, I used to be, but I'm not anymore. Well, why in the world did you get out of that class? You were so instrumental. Well, we had a falling out, you know. Somebody said something ugly, and it just really hurt me, so I'm never going back. So wait a second. You, you have your place of community for years with brothers and sisters in Christ. You did life together, and you had a conflict, and your way of dealing with it was throwing out the entire priority of community? You talk about the old proverbial throwing the baby out, of the, out with the bathwater. I've seen this through the years ministering to families at funerals. I'll go to a funeral and there's people in the family that won't speak to one another. The very time they need to give healing to one another. Some of you have been in that room and you can just, it's just so icy and cold and they have laid down the law that their priority is to make sure that they get justice and, and uh, they just won't speak. Sometimes it happens in another way, often a more subtle way, and that's what happens in this passage, where priorities just get out of whack. 
or the temptation is there. So the apostle's response to this entire ordeal might come across as arrogant at first, but it reveals what they've been asked to do. Look back at verse 2. It says, The twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, It would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Now, at first glance, you say, are they so self-important that they won't wait on tables? Of course that's not what they're saying. They are not ignoring the situation because that's why they brought everybody together to make the statement. We see throughout the book of Acts that these apostles are willing to go to great lengths to serve. This is not an ego trip that they're having. The implication is what they've been asked to do is abandon their priorities and shift them toward doing nothing but focusing on the crisis. And they said, we're not going to do that. This is always a temptation in crisis, to take our eyes off what matters. This is the consistent temptation of the church through the ages, to chase crisis at the expense of the mission. It wasn't that the apostles didn't care about discrimination. The apostles knew the only way to bring about lasting transformation was to preach the word and guide people in a life of consistent prayer. That was what was going to bring transformation and healing in this situation. But the idea of priorities is so common, sometimes it loses its meaning. When we think of priorities, we think of those things we think are most important. That's not your priorities. It's just what you think is most important. Your priorities are the things that you say yes to at the expense of everything else. You know your priorities by what you say no to. See, we demonstrate, we reveal the priorities of these men by what they said no to here. They said that's really important. We know we need to address the problem. But the great disservice we'd have is to say yes to that and say no to this over here. And that's what God's called us to do. We're not going to eliminate or abandon our priorities just because of a crisis. Do you see? Not a week goes by that somebody doesn't, usually a good friend or a kind person, doesn't send me an email or text or catch me after the service and say, Pastor, you've got to address this issue. I mean, you've got to abandon all else. It's worse than it's ever been. We've got to talk about this and nothing else. Well, the problem is if I chased every crisis and reset the church's priorities from the pulpit every time there's a crisis, then I'd only preach about this much of the word of God to you, and it'd probably just be the stuff that you like, right? And and the problem, I said before, people love it when I preach on sin, just not on our sin, right? And so God's called us to preach the whole counsel. And we know that God has commissioned us at Kingsland to preach the gospel to a lost world, to see, do everything we can to see revival in the home, to, to be sold out to gospel missions and move in the direction of hurting people all around the world in a unique way. And we are laser focused on those, praying that God would allow us to see 10,000 homes transformed by the power of the gospel. We can't do that and just adjust every 10 minutes or two days or one year and say, well, let's do this now. Or I read this book and we're gonna do this now. No, we're gonna focus on what God has called us to do. And here's the beauty. When we invite the Lord to work in our hearts in this way and he brings revival in and through us, then all of a sudden he begins to heal these other things as well. So we cannot, we cannot succumb to the temptation of assuming the worst. We cannot succumb to the temptation of abandoning the best. Now here's the last temptation that all of us face that the apostles dealt with right away. The temptation to avoid the concern. The temptation to avoid the concern. You look back at the beginning of verse 2, and it says, The twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples. Don't miss this. Remember, is the church in good shape or bad shape at the time? Great shape. They're growing. They're adding to their number. Presumably a lot of good things are happening. And this one complaint arises, and we know in context that it had kind of permeated. Everybody's talking about it. But they, they could have said, hey, we don't want to mess with this right now with everything good happening. Let's focus on the good. I appreciate that even though the church was growing, they dealt with it right away. Listen, some of us, in response to this message, need to address some conflict. You need to have the difficult conversation. You need to sit down. Not not an email, not a text, unless you're emailing to say, can we please sit down? One-on-one, face-to-face, seeking understanding, expressing sorrow, not just to get together and hammer somebody for how they hurt you, but seeking reconciliation, gaining understanding of the problem. That's what Jesus had in mind in Matthew 5, 9, when he said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. 
The heart of peacemaking means to be the kind of person who doesn't make waves. That's what some people think. That's, that's not what it means. The heart of peacemaking means what? It means you might need to make waves because you're entering into conflict. Otherwise, you're not making peace. You're just hoping for peace. We know that it can't just be avoiding making waves. You know why? Because it says you'll be called the sons of God. In other words, you'll be like Jesus. How did Jesus make peace? Did he avoid making waves? No, no, he, he made a lot of waves, but he entered into a, 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 a challenge over and over again. He brought truth and light there, and he was able to bring peace, lasting peace by doing that. Do you see the difference? Peacemaking is entering into the tension of relationship in order to bring about lasting peace. A lot of people are peace lovers, not peacemakers. You got to be willing to step in. It's like the, the stranger who steps into the fight to stop it. He might not be welcoming at the time, but he's bringing about something that's going to bring a lot of healing, saving people a ton of heartache later on. Peacemakers are seeking to bring an end to hostility, not just an end to the attention to hostility. Do you see the difference? If you just ignore problems, that doesn't make you a peacemaker, it makes you a peace liker. You got to have the conversation, you got to deal with it. And I love this. Verse 5 says, this proposal pleased the whole company. They went from strife to somebody being willing to step up and say, I'm going to tell you something. We're going to address it. I'm not even going to tell you what you want to hear because we're still going to hold to our priorities. But we're going to talk about it, and we're going to bring understanding. And guess what? It brought unity. They were grateful somebody dealt with a problem. So how do you have a peacemaking conversation? Some of you need to, so let's just get real practical before we close. And uh, I want to give you three things that we see with the apostles that you need to do if you're going to have a peacemaking conversation. All right, number one, deal with the conflict as soon as possible. So in the future, when it happens, as soon as you can, when it's inappropriate, sit down. Uh, if it's already happened, as soon as possible is today, all right? Deal with the conflict as soon as possible. Second, deal with conflict personally with those involved. Keep the circle of communication as small as possible. In this case, it had permeated the whole church. They brought all the disciples together. In most cases, you look at Matthew 18 as the example, it's going to be one-on-one, -on -one, brother to brother, brother to sister. It's going to be two-on-two. -two. It's going to be just a few. It might just be a small group. But you bring those in a room and you say, listen, we need to talk about this because there's been hurt. You own what you can and say, how can we find a place of resolution and peace here? Do you see? Deal with the conflict personally with those involved. Third, deal with the conflict graciously, recognizing that we're broken people too. The men chosen by the apostles tell us a great deal about the spirit in which we should deal with conflict. Look at verse 3. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. Full of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Remember? It means being under complete control of the Spirit of God. That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no agendas, no vendettas, no personal pride. And second, full of wisdom. What's that? The ability to discern that which will be most helpful for the edification of the body. And as we've already talked about, the ability to discern truths from half-truths. But guess what happens when we humble ourselves in this way and we make peace? Verse 7, and they multiplied greatly. Do you know that God can bring victory out of conflict? He does it all the time. Only God can do that. When you allow God to work in your life, he can use you to take something that the enemy means to divide and actually to unite us. I will never forget a conversation I had about 15 years ago. I was a pastor, had a dear friend in town who was also a pastor, and we used to get together for coffee every now and then and pray for one another. He was a dear, dear friend. And we had something come up uh, related to a former member who had tried to divide us and play some games. And I was very uh, worried that we were going to lose our friendship. And I sat down and just shared how things had happened and some misunderstandings that had taken place. And I said, brother, if I have hurt you because I didn't pay attention or do my homework, I just want you to know I apologize. And he put his coffee cup down and he looked at me and he said, Ryan, I want you to know something. I'm too old to make new friends. <laughs> and it was a half-joking thing, but I still tear up when I think about it. He's in heaven now. But what he was saying was so profoundly true. He was saying, I love you, 
more than this conflict and this situation. And I love you so much, we're going to walk through it. And he remained one of my best friends until he went to heaven. Listen, God can use you as an agent of peace in the midst of a world full of conflict. That's what he does. That's what he does. So I want us to end today a little bit differently than we have sometimes in the past. I want us to end really allowing the Spirit of God to guide us to where the conflict is and where he's leading us to be peacemakers. And so both in the courts and here in the worship center, we're going to have a time after I pray uh, where we, we respond uh, to the Lord. Let's go to the Lord right now. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. And God, we can come before you recognizing that we are guilty dead in our sin, and because of our sin, Father, we are separated eternally from you. And Father, I know there's people watching today, there's people here today, and, and that's the conflict they have to deal with first, or nothing else matters. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that they would receive the grace that you have offered through Jesus Christ, and they would be saved and forgiven and set free today. So, Lord, as we move to this time of invitation, I pray for the man or woman who's here today who hasn't trusted you. I pray that they would respond by receiving that grace and they would respond through the beauty of baptism in obedience. God, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts now and show us where and how we might be peacemakers. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, church, I want you to remain with your heads bowed. We're going to respond today in a little different way, as I promised. And I want you to remain seated during this time, just sincerely and silently between your heart and God's. Would you, some of you already have a, a conflict in mind that you're walking through that's broken your heart. You just need to bring that to the Lord right now. Say, Lord, would you bring healing? God, would you show me how that I could be a part of that? Would you do what I can't do? Maybe... It's not somebody that you thought about when you walked in here today, but the Spirit of God's just tapping you on the shoulder and reminding you of something that's taken place, a hurt, a wound that's left without being treated, and God wants to use you as an agent of healing. Pastor, it's not my fault. I didn't say that. I said God wants to use you as an agent of healing. Oh, Lord, Pastor, you don't know how tough it is. You don't know what's going on. I don't. You're right. But I believe God can use you as an agent of healing. Just bring that to the Lord right now. Church, after I close in prayer in just a moment, this altar is going to be open. There will be ministers waiting. And as others dismiss, some of you need to come and talk to somebody. Perhaps you need to pray with someone about a friend or family member who you love dearly, who's in the midst of conflict right now, and just intercede on their behalf. Pray for healing and hope. There's others here who have never trusted Jesus, and I plead with you today, don't go one more minute without walking with Jesus, without making peace with Jesus. Would you come forward as others go back and just let us know of your desire to trust him today or to settle that in your heart if you're uncertain? All right, let's close today in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I'm grateful once again for the incredible blessing of your word where we can take these, these historic records from 2,000 years ago and see that they have direct application to our lives today. So, Father, I pray that your people would be an agent, be agents of healing. We stand ready to be used, God. In Jesus' name, amen.